back with Sir John Elliot Gardner and Dr. Jane Glover, and we're talking about Bach and Handel. I was wanted to ask each of you uh, your earliest recollection of being aware of Bach or Handel. Uh, John Elliot, many people who have read your books uh, are aware of the fact that you as a toddler, literally as a toddler, walking up and down the stairs of your home, encountered the famous Hausmann portrait of J.S. Bach, which was in your, your house for safekeeping during the war. What are your memories of that, uh, that portrait? What did you think of that old guy? Oh, I was scared of him. I, mean, I was terrified of him. I, I, I found that look, um, the wigged look, um, and myopic look, um, the jowliness of his face, really very off-putting. And I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile it with the joyous uh, impression I had of his music, because um, I was very lucky to, to, to be exposed very early on as a, as, as a, as a treble to the motets. Um, and I, I think I knew them pretty much by heart by the time I was 12. I mean, we sang them a lot at home. And, and I, what I loved about the motets was this, this incredible exuberance and, jo and joy, as well as um, dealing with, um, I don't suppose I thought about it at the time, but we're looking back on it now, they were dealing with, with, with funerals and deaths, a lot of them. But Bach yeah. has such a, a wonderful way. I mean, Bach has, has a way of um, approaching the subject of death in a, in a way that is so consoling. And, and I found that with people who are not particularly religious, um, that they, they take comfort um, from listening or performing Bach's music um, more than any other composer. Um, and it took me a long time. In fact, it wasn't until I started writing the book that I began to, to, to be able to bridge that gap between the, the, the cantor, the, the image of the cantor and the, the, the music, the musician. And you, I think you can do it by dividing um, in your mind, anyway, his face into two halves. And if you look at the upper half, it's very much the cantor and the, 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 the um, Yes, the cantor, really, the very serious musician. The lower half is a man of the world, um, perhaps not as much as, as Handel, but, but somebody who enjoyed his food, who enjoyed uh, all the good things in, in, in life, um, and a much more approachable human being than the top half. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that that's that the case. Uh, there's, there's a point that I find very interesting. I just totted up in Jane's book on Handel, there are seven pages on, on which the name Bach is mentioned. In my book on Bach, there's 21 pages on the subject of Handel. Now, is that significant? <laughs> I ask myself. Because, but, go on. They're just fleeting references in your book to Handel. Don't think I haven't no, done no, that. No, 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 well. no. <laughs> I won't have that. I, I won't have that. I, they're quite detailed references. Well, uh, what I love, I love your section on the class of 85, and um, uh, which uh, the, uh, the other composers around that, not just him and the, the two of them and Domenico Scarletti, but then also you stretch it to include um, Rameau and Telemann. <laughs> Course, and Madison, who you say is was actually in the in their time, was the most famous of the lot. Yeah, and which is astonishing, really, because that's the one uh, that we've we've all lost sight of. Really, but he was insufferable, wasn't he? Don't you think he? Well, okay, yes, and of course he nearly killed Handel. When he nearly had, killed Handel. They had, right, but they had a row and uh, and a duel for God's sake. And, no, um, but the point I'm the point I'm making is is, is not to score points. I'm not trying to score points, but just to say no, that I, you, I think that Handel is really important. In, if you're just discussing Bach, I think Handel was um, a, a musician whom he revered enormously, um, and. There's that um, letter from C.P. Bach, well, we don't know it's C.P. Bach, it's probably a C.P. Bach to, to Forkel, um, Bach's first biographer, where he says something like that um, Handel didn't trust himself to challenge, to, 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 to the challenge of comparison with Bach, a bit like Louis Marchand, the, the French organist who ran away from it. Do you think that's, that's plausible, that, Bach, that Handel was perhaps a little bit scared of comp comparing being compared to Bach? Well, I wonder. I mean, he would certainly have recognised the, the, the phenomenal quality to his stuff and realised that, um, that, that, you know, it, it's a bit like Haydn meeting Mozart, you know, uh, that you discover that there's somebody who's not only as good as you when you think you are the best in the, in the pile, that actually there's somebody who's better than you. And uh, um, for, for all his sort of confidence and... Um, optimism and outgoing personality and so on. I mean, I think uh, 
um, he had tremendous humility uh, or form uh, with other people, uh, with with other with other composers like that, and he would have felt uh, in awe of Bach as you did of his portrait. Jane, you may not have had a portrait on your uh, stairway as a young girl. Uh, you have mentioned meeting uh, Benjamin Britten and Peter Peers when you were young, but what are your earliest recollections of Bach and Handel? Do you remember? Well, I, you know, I didn't sadly have a, a, a musical upbringing. I mean, I, didn't, I, mean I, I was a musical child but, and you know, played piano and oboe and so on, but I sort of lived in the middle of nowhere and we didn't hear much uh, live music. I heard my first Messiah when I was nine and that uh, uh, was life changing. Um, I, I recognized in it, uh, it was a, a um, performance in Lincoln Cathedral. Um, my parents, grandparents lived in, in Lincoln. We were there for Christmas and and this, this changed my life, I think. I, I sort of was transfixed by this extraordinary music. And what's really interesting about it is that it wasn't, you know, the sort of big stuff that, uh, you know, it wasn't the Alleluia Chorus or the Mighty Amen, for heaven's sake, or, um, or, or even the, the sort of the, the beastly crowd <laughs> scenes in the, in the Passion bit. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was, I know that my Redeemer liveth was the thing that really spoke to me as a nine-year-old. I think that's quite interesting, don't you? Mm. I think um, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, and uh, you know, when we got home, I got home, one of my parents had vocal scores. They did sing in, in uh, amateur calls societies, and so there was a score of Messiah, and that was the thing I went to. Um, as to Bach, um, um, my parents had uh, gramophone records of the uh, Brandenburg concertos, and I knew all those by the time I was nine as well, but uh, it just, you know, absorbing second hand. Um. It's fascinating what you say about, um, uh, I know that my redeeming really liveth, I, I totally agree with that. It sort of represents a quality that I think is so pronounced in Handel, which is that the times when you feel he's addressing you personally, he's, yeah. his music is so targeted towards you as an individual. But absolutely, but I think also, interestingly, and because it took me several decades to, to come to this realization, I think it's his own credo too. I mean, his faith was so important to him. Yeah. And, and the beginning of part three, we've been through the, uh, the, the Christmas story, we've been through the passion, and here we are at the sort of, at the redemption section, which is effectively, as you say, all about us. And, and uh, he puts his own, his own faith in there, I think, in a, in a very big way. very strange experience for 10 years um, being director of the, the, the Göttingen Handel Festival and, and I loved it because it gave me a chance to do lots of Handel and lots of oratory. I did very little opera, I just did Tamilano uh, of the operas, um, oh. but it gave me a chance to do, to do them and it was so strange doing that in Germany but doing these oratorios in English language with period instruments when Göttingen had had the tradition right up until the Second World War I mean, all through the Nazi times of um, changing the plots, changing the scoring, changing everything, you know, to, to, to fit a political agenda. I mean, it's unbelievable what, what uh, um, uh, kind of aesthetic abuse those pieces were subjected to. Until very recently, which is incredible. Extraordinarily recently. 
I mean, you know, Israel and Egypt was, was the Mongol horde in, in, in Nazi Germany, ah. the Mongol horde. And I remember, you know, when we first, I mean, we did uh, Semele, Hercules, Jephthah, um, Saul, uh, Alexander Spies, a whole lot of them anyway. And, and, when, and because we're using countertenors, very good counter, people like Michael Chance, um, in, the, in the castrato roles, uh, or the, the alto roles, uh, it was shock horror to start with. The audience weren't, weren't you know, and we're talking about the 1980s. I mean, it's not that long ago. Um, but for, for the Germans who could not come to terms with the fact that here was a son of their soil who'd actually gone to England, you know, Das Land ohne Musik. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, his life there. As a matter of interest, have you done The Brockers Passion? No, I never have done. Is it no, well, do you know, I mean, sorry, we're off script now, Carl, but I just have to say this. Um, Quite all right. Because uh, I haven't either, but um, it's one of the things I've looked at in lockdown, you know, I, as, as we entered lockdown and, 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 you know, the whole of the Easter thing yeah. was, was, was cancelled and, you know, no passions. No, no, no. So I thought I'm going to look at this Brocker's passion. I don't know it. I've never done it. And I'm, I cannot wait to do it. It is really? amazing music. It's amazing. It really is wonderful, and um, I, you know, I, I've 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 done a rehearsal schedule. I've done a stage plan. I'm ready to go. I've I've really? I spent time with it all over Easter, and it was wonderful. It sort of got me through that first couple of weeks of lockdown. Tell me, do, can you cope with Brock's words and his very lurid um, descriptions well, of the okay. I think we might have to make the odd tweak, uh, <laughs> but yes, but why not? I mean, it's um. um Yes, it is very lurid. It is, yeah. And but I know the, the Pinnaman versions of it, and I don't, don't care for them very much. Well, I, have you done that? No, because I, I don't like the text. Right, but uh, but I think we'll take a look at the handle. And yeah, I will. I will. Because I, I actually think, and again, the, the R is a short, and the drama bowls along. I mean, he tells the story. I mean, it's as it's it's as, it's as quick as the St John Passion, if not more so. Really. Yeah. Really. So, Bach, uh, course, Bach sort of used the bits of Brockers in, in his St. John Passion. I mean, indeed, yeah. So, uh, I mean, Handel never did it. Uh, so, uh, it's uh, it's one of these great sort of um, question marks, really, uh, yeah. as, uh, in in his in his life. And and I I've never really paid much attention to it, and I should have done. And now I have. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. It's very interesting. <laughs> Sorry, Carl. Well, that's really, that's really very close to where I was going to go. I was going to ask either of you uh, if there is any work by Bach for Handel that you just haven't gotten around to and mean to and want to, uh, or is there a particular favorite? Maybe some lesser known piece that's just always been one of your favorites. You go first. Um, of Bach or <laughs> Handel? Well, gosh. <laughs> um, is there a piece of Bach I've not done and would like to do? Well, I've dozens of the cantatas I have yet to touch, I have to say, and I so envy you, you're, you've done them all, haven't you, John Elliott? Uh, yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, is there a note of Bach you haven't conducted? Oh, yes. I haven't done uh, quite a few of the secular cantatas and the changing of the town council and all that sort okay, of stuff. Yes, all that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, I, I think the things that, I, that one re returns to in Bach, of course, are, 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 are the mighty passions and the B minor, which is, uh, is this great miracle, and, and the, the, the big Christmas oratorio. But, you know, sometimes when I'm doing the Brandenburgs, I just think, actually, the slow movement of the sixth Brandenburg is the greatest piece of music ever written. That's I mean, wonderful. it's just it's unbelievable. It's completely perfect, and yeah. uh, it's so spare. And it's just so six instruments. And, you know, it's just a handful of instruments, and and it's uh, it just blows my mind every time. Uh, that's what I would say about Bach.
the handle that I do and have done, which is, it is actually a lot. Uh, one of my favorites is actually L'Allegro. Yes. Uh, and we were talking about, you know, you were talking about how difficult it is to get to know J.S. Bach yeah. because of the very few personal letters, unlike Mozart or Monteverdi or Berlioz, for heaven's sake. Um, um, it's very difficult to get to know Handel also through letters because you know his are all business letters really, uh, mostly written in French, which was not his first language nor the language of the country he was living in, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's that one personal letter to his brother-in-law after his sister died, but that's about it. And uh, I feel that the way we get to know Handel um, is th through his music when you, and, you look, I stare at that portrait often, but, um, but the, you know, the, 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 the great thing about L'Allegro, this, this brilliant, brilliant poem by Milton, which has the cheerful side versus the pensive man, the cheerful man, the pensive man. And we get this dialogue between the two of them, effectively, told with such wit in, in Handel's music. And of course, the, I think we see a lot of him in this, a, yeah. a really a lot of him, not just the sort of extrovert, uh, L'Allegro type, but even more the Penseroso type. Um, and not the moderato type, because he wasn't a moderato, was he? No, and he wasn't, but it, I think it was Jenens's genius to, to write that, and particularly the duet that sort of resolves it. No, at the end, that's heaven. Which is a heaven, and it's a brilliant um, um, uh, a version of Shakespeare, and, and it just is, is brilliantly set by Handel. Um, as steals them all. No, is that what it's called? Yes, as steals yes, them all. As steals them all. Um, but uh, you know, there are things in 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 the in the Penseroso music where, you know, oft on a plat of rising ground, I hear the oh. far curfew sound, and you know, it all so spare, and um, and and that which ends. Um, when, when eventually that the person who's walking outside comes inside, where glowing embers through the room teach light to counterfeit a gloom. That's right. An immense, amazing, amazing couplet. But you sort of think that's who Handel was, you know? Yeah. Yet at the end of the day, he liked to come back to Brook Street and shut the door and look at the fire. now anyway with well, I just about starting with Handel um, I'm, I've never done Theodora and I belong to do Theodora oh, yeah um, that's and, and then many of the operas I mean I, I, I would love to do Rinaldo which I haven't done particularly um, I, but I, I, I would be probably a bit savage with some of the cuts in because I do feel that, that, that both um, Giulio Cesare goes on too long and um, Aria Dante goes on too long I mean but um, what I love about Handel, and, and I feel frustrated with, I would, the pieces of Handel that I love the best are ones when I think, well, why don't you follow that? I mean, like Dixit Dominus, I want another piece like Dixit Dominus, and there isn't. I want another piece like Asis and Galatea, and it isn't quite. I mean, there is Esther, and there's, as you say, L'Allegro, which is beautiful, and I've just been doing Semele, which is absolutely wonderful. When it comes to Bach, uh, it's, it's, it's much harder, because, uh, I mean, with Bach, um, huh. I mean, we're, we're, we're broadcasting a cantata each Sunday on, the on our website, taken from the cantata pilgrimage we did um, in 2000. And I, and you know, the roughly three, sometimes four cantatas that he wrote that have survived per Sunday. And I find it very, very difficult to choose the best out of which one. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it just absolutely leaves me gobsmacked 
um, every time the cantata comes up on a Sunday and I listen to it and I think, I, I can't remember how good, this, I've forgotten how good this one is. I mean, there is so little, you said that a handle is incapable of writing a, a, a bad bar of music. Pretty much the same can be said of Bach too. Um, but the pieces that I come back to um, with Bach, again, apart from the obvious ones, the Passions, the Christmas Oratorio, the, the, the B minor Mass, are often the very early cantatas. Um, uh, I mentioned um, Chris Lag in Tordes Banden, Cantata 4, Cantata 106, um, Cantata 131, Aus der Tiefe. Uh, most of the Weimar cantatas are just spectacular. Um, and I think the, if I had to take a single Sunday of Bach's oeuvre, it would be the 16th Sunday after Trinity, because on, for that Sunday, I mean, it's, you know, it could have been the 20th or 9th Sunday, but it's actually the 16th Sunday. It's on the subject of trust, of, of comfort to the bereaved. And that's something that he does so, so well, that, that he, because maybe because there was so much infant, infant mortality in his own, his, his own family, and because he was orphaned himself and, and, and lost his parents by the time he was nine, both of them. And then he lost his first wife, um, Maria Barbara, on the only time he ever went any distance. He, he went into what is now the Czech Republic. And when he came back, she'd already been, um, she died and been buried. That death was so ever present in his imagination, he had to come to terms with it. And I don't think that his faith was so solid that it never had any, that he never had any momentary doubts. I mean, I don't know whether you feel agree with me, but there's a passage in the B minor mass at the um, at expecto, um, the, 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 the in the credo, um, confite unum baptisma, and he starts it off in a very old-fashioned style of confite or with great big cantus firmuses in long notes and so on, and then the whole edifice crumbles and it goes into this murky, really complex piece of 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 no man's land. Um, to the words, and I look for the resurrection of the dead. And you think, well, does he? Does he look for the resurrection of the dead? Is he certain? Well, yes, in the end, because you get that scale down to D major and you're off in the Allegro et expecto. But there is that moment which suggests to me that, that he was assailed with doubts. They may have been temporary, but, you know, they, they, they were things that he had to deal with and he had to process.
what if Bach had traveled a little more and, and became more cosmopolitan and, and ended up in London? Could he have flourished in that setting or was that just not possible knowing his temperament? Likewise, if Handel had just decided to stay in Germany and be a court composer or a church musician, could he have done that? Did their circumstances inform the music or did they, did they both end up in the right place for the people they were? Well, I think we've got to thank God that they did end up where they did end up because otherwise we wouldn't have had the wonderful music that came out of them. I think Handel would have made a, would made a better fist of the job as cantor of um, St. Thomas's Leipzig than Bach would have been um, at, the, at, in, at the Haymarket Theatre. Um, it's not to say that Bach would have been incapable of writing operas. I mean, I would challenge anybody to find more operatic music or more theatrical music than you find in, in, in a lot of the cantatas and indeed in the passions. Yeah. He chose not to write a, a, an opera and I think that was deliberately, um, we could come on to that later, but um, Handel was much more of a man of the world than Bach and, and, and he, um, he may, may have always retained his very strong German accent and his French might not have been that good, but Bach didn't have languages either. And Handel had this wonderful cosmopolitan side to him um, and this curiosity. Um, I mean, if, 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 you are, if you could rephrase the question and say, yes, having gone to Italy and having traveled and then not come to England, had he gone to Leipzig, would he have made a fist of it? Yes, I think he would, because he would have stood up to the town councillors probably much more belligerently than Bach did. Um, Bach uh, would have had a wonderful time if he'd gone to Italy, if he'd followed um, Dürer, Schütz um, and uh, Handel obviously across the Alps and later on um, Goethe and Mendelssohn. I mean how enriching that was for all of them and for their art. Um, but there was something very rooted about him. I think it's to do with the clan structure of the Bach family. I mean growing up in Thuringia um, being a Bach was synonymous with being a musician and a lot of them did um, survive, just about survive the Thirty Years' War, but it was very, very tough on them. They, they, they only just got by, and there was a huge amount of mortality, infant mortality and otherwise, in the Bach family. And uh, Bach was thrown back on his own resources enormously um, because he was orphaned. And, and, you know, one of the things that, that came out in, 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 in the research that I did for the, um, uh, for the Bach book was um, his relationship with his elder brother, uh, Johann Christoph. Um, the traditional view is that um, they didn't get on at all, that Bach was, was so sort of squashed out of shape that he left and went, uh, walked all the way to, to, to Lüneburg and to leave the house. Um, there, there's evidence that's come to light in the last 20, 15 years, which shows that actually they formed a very close bond between the two of them. And that uh, Johann Christoph said, listen, I, I will take care of the southern German organ tradition. I will deal with Pachelbel. You go up north and deal with the, the, the northerners. So he went to Lüneburg and he studied with um, uh, various people uh, who, were, who, who had, you know, the, the northern tradition. And they, their musicians, their, their compositions came together in the Bach archive, which was discovered by Christoph Wolf in, in Kiev um, only about 20 years ago and has gradually come to light. So it's fascinating that, 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 that they, they weren't in opposition, but they were, they were in cahoots with one another. Jane, your thoughts? Could they have traded places? Oh, well, I, as, as John Elliott said, I think Handel would have been fine anywhere. Um, uh, he, uh, and as I said at the beginning of this conversation, you know, he probably had his sights set on other places anyway until London sort of spoke to him and, and rooted him. Um, uh, he, of course, had started his operatic life in Hamburg, which was a major uh, centre of opera, in, of Italian opera in, in Germany. And uh, which, which indeed John Elliott writes about also in, in his book, because so many people went through there. Um, as to, would he have had a, a sort of, would he have settled with a church job? I, I think... I think ultimately he would have been frustrated by that, that it wouldn't have been quite enough for him. Um, uh, so I think that's what I would say about that. And so as Johnny that said, aren't we lucky that they did end up where they ended up and we have what we have. <laughs>